Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Lee Roderick. I'm Washington Bureau Chief for Scripps League Newspapers and President of the Club. I'd like to welcome my fellow club members and their guests in the audience today, as well as those of you who are listening to this program over one of the more than 350 national public radio stations or watching on one of the 2600 cable systems affiliated with C-SPAN, the Cable Satellite Public Affairs Network. Before going any further, I'd like to remind our members of some coming events. On April 14th, Carl, Carl Otto Pool, president of the Central Bank of West Germany, will be with us. On April 18th, Dr. Jack Albertine, the chairman of the President's Aviation Safety Commission, will be here. And on April 21st, Labor Secretary Ann McLaughlin will be our guest. I'd like to remind those of you in the audience that if you have questions for our speaker today, and I'm sure you will, please write them on the cards furnished at your tables and pass them up. I'll ask as many as time allows. I'd like now to introduce the guests at our head table. I'll ask our guests to please stand briefly when their names are read. I'll ask you in the audience to please withhold your applause until all the names are read. Starting at my left and your right, we have David Skidmore, the Associated Press. Sherry Winston, Knight Ritter Financial News. Tom Petruno, Markets Editor of USA Today. Patricia Krantz, McGraw-Hill News Service. Peter Kelly of the Harrisburg Patriot News and the member of our Speakers Committee who organized today's luncheon. The Honorable Donald McHenry, former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. We'll go past our speaker for the moment to Greg Spears, regional reporter for Knight Ritter Newspapers and chairman of our Speakers Committee. Austin Kiplinger, the editor of the Kiplinger Washington Letter. Kenneth Liebler, president of the American Stock Exchange. Shirley Hobbs Schiebler, the senior editor, excuse me, senior Washington editor of Barron's. John Riley of Newhouse News Service. And Bill Sternberg of Crane's New York Business. Each month on its last page, the Atlantic Monthly prints a handful of new words on the fringe of American English speech. In the April issue, we learn about tree hugger. The term hasn't yet made it into the American Heritage Dictionary, but it already has two meanings. In its original sense, radical environmentalist, it could be applied to today's luncheon speaker. It could, that is, if you consider it radical to coax pampered executives onto exploring trips through the Badlands on horseback as he recently did. That's pretty radical. When Who's Who lists his club memberships, the first on the list is the Adirondack, Adirondack, did I say that either time right? <laughs> Mountain Club. But there's a new meaning as well for tree hugger that will never be applied to this captain of industry. It refers to a company executive who clings to various branches of the same corporate tree all of his career. Nowadays, changing jobs a few times doesn't make you disloyal. It's simply proof that you're not suffering future shock. Today, I present to you a former newspaper reporter, magazine promoter, and cattle salesman. He's been a stockbroker on a shoestring and later president of the investment firm now known as Shearson American Express. He wrote a book on how to make, called How to Make Your Money, Make Money. And he's also a fixture in New York art circles and a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Williams College. Not long ago, he led a group that told New York Mayor Ed Koch how to build Westway, the controversial $810 million highway down the Manhattan waterfront. This winter, he joined an international cross-section of leaders in Central America, brainstorming solutions to the region's chronic economic problems. His next horizon may be publishing. He owns the Battery News, a weekly newspaper that serves the southern tip of Manhattan, and two years ago purchased a majority share in a tiny Washington weekly called Roll Call. He quickly doubled its size, which has gone on to an even greater size since then, and Roll Call continues to be must-reading on Capitol Hill. Today, Mr. Levitt returns to Washington to share some thoughts with us on the giant stock market crash of last October and its aftermath. Almost six months after the crash, financial analysts still argue over what, startling, what the startling slide meant, 
and what business investors and politicians ought to do about it. The last time that he was with us was in 1982, and the nation was still fighting a recession. Mr. Levitt was then four years into his job as chairman of the American Stock Exchange and self-appointed leading lobbyist for its roster of small and mid-sized companies. He said it seemed that nothing could excite business leaders about the economy, even Ronald Reagan's pro-business agenda in Washington. Now the political climate is far less certain. The stock crash was supposed to shake the foundations of our financial institutions, yet all the normal indicators seem to show business as usual. Recent months indeed have been good ones for Mr. Levitt, who is now 57 years old. Soon after taking over the exchange, he started the American Business Conference, which represents 100 mid-sized, high-growth firms. He has aggressively recruited new members for the Amex, which regularly lost listings to consolidation and its larger competitor, the New York Stock Exchange. <coughs> Last year, his exchange showed a gain from 532 to 585 listed firms. In the first quarter of 1988, the Amex market value index gained nearly 5% the highest gain among the broad-based market indexes. So, Mr. Levitt, please tell us, just how do you explain what has happened since last fall on Wall Street? Ladies and gentlemen, Arthur Levitt. Thank you very much. Three events crystallize for me the fundamental issues that I'd like to discuss with you today. A month ago, while getting a haircut, my barber asked me to recommend a stock. I told him that as exchange chairman, I wasn't allowed to, to do that. And I suggested that he call his broker. He replied, I don't really have much confidence in him. On March 18th, the president appointed a committee to report back to him within 60 days with specific proposals to coordinate the government's reaction to the crash. Last Tuesday, I was talking with a young analyst who announced with pride that he had just passed the second stage on the road to becoming a chartered financial analyst. These days, the single most frequent question I'm asked is this, Arthur, is the worse over or yet to come? Six months have elapsed since October 19th, which nearly saw the total collapse of international markets, and we're still arguing about definitional differences, free market ideology, and jurisdictional turf. Time is running short, both for dealing with obvious technological deficiencies and for a strategic appraisal of our markets. Furthermore, the conditions that created the atmosphere in which a market meltdown nearly occurred are still present, creating a kind of economic time bomb that threatens the whole system. What are those conditions? One, our deficit has not been satisfactorily addressed, and the inevitable recession will vastly limit options available to us today. Two, technological and regulatory solutions identified in recent reports are being widely debated but not enacted. Three, the securities industry has not yet come to grips with perceptual problems that have helped prevent the restoration of public confidence in the fairness of our markets. Four, we continue to emphasize short-term trading over long-term investment. Had there been no market rebound these past months, we would have been approaching these problems with what I think is a much greater sense of immediacy. Complacency is an invitation for history to repeat itself. The conventional wisdom is that politically, nothing can be done about the federal deficit until the first 100 days of the new administration. I think it can, and I think we are rapidly running out of time. The President should invite the legislative leaders in the newly appointed Budget Commission to Camp David and keep them there for as long as it takes to agree to a 50% reduction in the deficit by 1990. We now have a trillion dollar budget. If we simply cut 2% for the next two years, that would be $40 billion by 1990. 
The gasoline and other consumption taxes could raise another $20 billion. Economic growth could produce $20 billion more. Together, that's $80 billion, one half of the deficit. It's doable. What's needed and what's not there is the political will. Of course, it isn't easy. But the basic outlines of a compromise are in place. Unfortunately, I don't see any of the current presidential candidates really taking the bull by the horns on this issue. We should act and act now. Over the past four weeks, I've surveyed individuals who know and deal with and are involved in our industry. I've met with them, I've called them, I've invited them to my office, I've gone to see them, and I've asked my staff to talk to still others. They were heads of large brokerage firms. They were floor specialists, large investors, small investors, brokers, business school deans, and listed company CEOs. They were government regulators and former regulators, journalists, congressmen, and former exchange chiefs, maybe 45 in all. This mini-survey found a tremendous diversity of opinion. It found pessimism, optimism, suggestions, concern, anger, confusion, and I guess most of all, finger pointing. The one thing that I didn't find was indifference. Most thoughtful observers agree that there really was no one single cause for the precipitous decline. Macroeconomic conditions, speculative markets, and technological overloads all contributed to the crash. It was unrealistic to assume that the financial markets could remain immune from the economic woes piling up in every part of our society. The budget deficit, pressures of global industrial competition, and great strains in the banking system served notice that we were on a very slippery slope. For the last decade, we've seen new products, new strategies, new trading techniques proliferate in the securities industry. But each marketplace, each securities firm, was intent on nurturing its own innovation. So I guess we neglected to examine the trading system as a whole. Furthermore, markets which throughout our history have provided corporate America with stable long-term investment funds have become so short-term oriented as to threaten the whole capital raising process. This, I believe, is a reflection of the preoccupation of our society with short-term gain. Instead of looking beyond the horizon, corporate America tends to focus on the next quarter. We need to refocus our tax and incentive structures away from quick profits and toward long-term profitability. Short-term trading strategies may contribute to liquidity. They may indeed smooth out disparities between markets, but they really are no future, they are really no substitute for investing in the future for investing in jobs, productivity, and competitiveness. Among the casualties of the October 19th crash were nearly 40 initial public offerings that were ready to come to the American Stock Exchange and then withdrew. That meant postponement of new plants, new jobs, and expansion into new markets. It's clear that the pre-October budget and trade deficits, the falling dollar and rising interest rates, had left our markets vulnerable to a fairly violent downdraft. The Brady Report correctly analyzed the free fall of October 19th and 20th as being triggered by an institutional stampede to get out, to get out fast and at whatever cost. This was exacerbated by a relatively small handful of institutions and the serious breakdown of linkages between our equity and commodity markets. The Brady Report is also correct that the various markets for stocks, stock index futures, and stock options are indeed one market. By and large, I support as prudent and reasonable the recommendations to slow down the market process and dampen speculation during periods of turmoil. Let's act on proposals to forge cooperation across markets, employ circuit breakers when needed, and above all, to improve clearing procedures. 
Of course, it makes sense to inject more capital on the trading floors and to harmonize margin requirements across markets. We also need closer coordination between the banks and the securities industry. Today, these two entities even observe different holidays. What would happen, for example, if October 19th had fallen on Columbus Day, when the banks were closed and the exchanges were open? Who then could have injected the essential liquidity into the system? I think the Brady Report and the other reports and the congressional hearings have been of great value. And I think that the new presidential working group announced last month has the potential to bring useful short-term clarity to the issues that are now on the table. I eagerly wait its return on May 19th. These groups are fine. They were reacting within a limited time frame to October. They were looking at a specific issue, and they were trying to develop fast remedies. But a lot more is needed, and needed soon. I'm recommending that the President, the Congress, and the industry together reach into history and appoint a special study commission. This commission would step back and take the long view and tell us where our industry should be going over the next decade. Its focus would not be on last October. Rather, it must come up with solutions that will enable our markets to meet today's totally new international competitive challenges. The events of October remind us that we now live in a 24-hour global financial environment. Evaluations made by investors in the Far East, communicated in milliseconds through satellite technology, reverberate in our own markets. To restore stability to our markets, we must not only put our macroeconomic house in order, but we've got to re-examine the fundamental ways our securities industry operates today. We have become accustomed to seeing ourselves as the inevitable financial center of the world. There is no reason why it must always be so. We as an industry must see ourselves as competitors rather than merely as inheritors. The Special Study Commission I am proposing would be composed of prominent individuals enjoying broad public support. It would be chaired by an individual with the stature of Paul Volcker or Pete Peterson. Its mandate would be to restore confidence in the system. The depth and scope of this task would require a two-year time span and a commission that would have the bite of subpoena power. The last such analysis began in 1961 under the auspices of the SEC. Not completed until 1963, it was a comprehensive examination of every facet of the securities industry. It studied investor protection, commission rates, odd lot trading, the over-the-counter market, the specialist system, regulatory controls, automation, and other issues of the time. Out of its deliberation came a thorough and responsible foundation for action. Its six-volume special study became the springboard for major legislative changes in securities acts and laid the groundwork for the development of today's financial industry. Those well-worn volumes remain within reach and are still referred to again and again. I've spoken to people who took part in that study. They agree that a new study should not be used as an excuse to delay action, but that in its broad sweep, it could prove immensely valuable. Let me reiterate that this proposal for a special study does not absolve our industry from responsibility of taking steps now to reattract individual investors to our markets. For that to occur, two conditions must be addressed. Individual investors will not return to our market unless they believe they can make money and they are convinced that the system is open and fair. Structural changes suggested by the Brady Commission address the fairness issue, but even more fundamental is the relationship between brokers and customers. That brings me back to the comments of my barber and to a concern that gnaws at me as I weigh my 25 years in the securities industry. Our image is somewhat tarnished. Tougher sentencing for insider trading is critical, but much more needs to be done. I believe the crash accentuated the failure of our industry to establish its professionalism in the minds of investors. That failure is retarding the restoration of confidence in our markets, and it has dangerous long-term implications 
to the futures of the securities industry. It is absolutely essential that brokers and investment advisors be accepted as professionals, just as doctors, lawyers, and accountants are accepted. After all, the broker is dealing with a basic component of the investor's life, with his or her income and pension and future economic well-being. Yet brokers, unhappily, are not regarded in that way today. Even before October, surveys showed that brokers were perceived by the public as having standards below professions such as clergymen, doctors, engineers, bankers, even lawyers and reporters. They were wedged in down the list somewhere between national and local politicians. This issue of professionalism relates to the expectations we as an industry generate among investors, to the signals, subtle and not so subtle, that we send out. Are we enticing investors with ideas of making lots of money in the shortest time, or instead are we offering them a secure future? We're talking about quality, which must have as much emphasis in the securities industry as in any other industry. In my judgment, this is a reflection of the way brokers are recruited, trained, and compensated. These are the areas that must be changed if brokers are to have the level of professionalism essential to restore confidence in the system. This isn't a simple issue. In the best of all worlds, the broker who does the best for his clients will attract the most customers. But investors also know that the broker who puts their funds into a sound long-term stock will not make as much in commission as one who trades. The problem goes beyond that. A broker who sells 1,000 shares of a company priced at $25 on an offering will receive a commission of nearly $700. The next day, the same broker can sell 1,000 shares of the same stock when the issue is exchange traded and receive only $320. Can the broker's judgment not be colored by this difference? And for the benefit of the investor, shouldn't we require more detailed disclosure of this? A commission system that is exclusively quantitative raises customers' fears that their brokers are doing business when the best strategy might be to sit tight. Over the years, I have spoken to thousands of retail brokers. I've been one. I know that they want to do the best for their clients, that they want their clients to make money. When I ask them to consider a base salary, coupled with less emphasis on commissions, so they can be more objective about the advice they render, some protest, but they do get interested. When I go on and suggest that maybe commissions should be more uniform across all products so that they have a greater incentive to direct their clients to the best investments, they get even more interested. Perhaps we should be moving toward an alternative commission methodology, an across-the-board percentage fee based upon assets under management to diminish the dependence on transaction charges. Of course, this is a very complex issue involving tough and expensive competitive concerns. We are dealing with the way brokers feel about themselves, as well as the general public perception. Brokers want to be treated as professionals. I feel their expertise entitles them to be. On this issue, I have a particular grievance. I feel one of the most damaging influences on the way the public views our industry is the wasteful, extravagant, and demeaning piracy used to barter brokers and entice entire offices from firm to firm. I know of an instance where a broker from one firm was offered a $100,000 bonus to go to another firm. After two years, he accepted a $150,000 bonus to jump to a third firm. Then a year later, he returned to his original firm for additional payouts of nearly $125,000. This is wrong. An industry code of ethics should be considered to discourage wholesale office piracy, and firms should be encouraged to train rather than raid. In fact, I believe the best way to establish professional credentials is through our training systems. Unfortunately, these expensive programs, which cost anywhere from twenty to $30,000 a trainee, are often the first to be reduced during business declines. Certainly, today's training programs are vast improvements over ones that once existed. While standards have tightened since then, firms still vary greatly in the quality of their programs. It is on this issue, in my judgment, where the battle will be fought for the professional standing of the 466,000 brokers. 
In this connection, I would urge that our industry establish a special institute for investment. This academy, perhaps in conjunction with the business schools that exist in various cities and with the self-regulatory organizations, would be responsible for training and qualifying all brokers and investment advisors. Brokers would be taught that this is a service industry, and the essence of service is to identify client needs. The broker must ascertain the financial goals of each client. Then the question is how to best meet these goals. The Institute would offer opportunities for advanced training in specialized products. Advanced degrees would be awarded. A series of tests that were sufficiently exacting and broad-based would assure public confidence in those who passed. Certain professionals in our field are recognized for study that leads to proficiency. The path my friend took on his journey to becoming a chartered financial analyst, for example, requires passing examinations with increasing levels of difficulty for three successive years. If the Institute for Investment was established creatively, I think the concept would be welcomed by the public, the firms, and the individual brokers. This will set a new standard of professionalism throughout our industry. The proposals, all of them, I think, will have an impact. But the task of restoring confidence in our markets is not just one for the securities industry alone. It's a job also for Capitol Hill and for the administration. Basically, you restore confidence in the markets when you restore confidence in the economy. An economic system has a unity. People either trust the system or they don't. If investors have no confidence that the budget deficits and the trade deficits will be brought under control, they're going to be skittish about our markets. Last November, we had the budget compromise, and it was just a good first step. But it was only that. If political expediency makes us unwilling to face reality now, we're going to pay much harsher consequences down the line. If bringing the deficit down requires some type of tax increase, most likely a consumption tax or a gasoline tax, let's face that reality. If it means revisiting certain areas of entitlement programs, even Social Security, so be it. If it means giving our presidents the line item veto, let's do it. October caused a shock to our entire system. I think we can work our way.